It's time for the Soteriology 101 podcast, where God is most glorified by his love and provision for all people. Welcome your host, the Director of Apologetics for Texas Baptists, an adjunct professor of theology and a local teaching pastor, Dr. Leighton Flowers. Welcome to Soteriology 101. Today we're going to talk about theological fatalism. Um, oftentimes, fatalism is something that's um, accused towards or uh, an accusation brought against Calvinistic believers. Of course, they, as compatibilists, deny fatalism, and the reason they hold to compatibilism is to try to avoid the charge of being theological fatalists. Um, and the debate has always been between compatibilist and incompatibilist, or those who would hold to a more libertarian freedom of the will, is ultimately to say, can you ex- escape your fatalistic tendencies by holding to certain premise, a certain premise that you that you um, that you have formulated within your theological worldview? And if your worldview is holding to a form of hard determinism that God has brought to pass all things for His glory, that all things are unchangeably decreed by and brought to pass by God for His greatest glory, can you escape the charge of theological fatalism? So before we play a clip from John Piper, who's asked the question about how do you avoid fatalism, um, I want I want to give you a, a direct definition. This is from uh, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, so a, a credible source here. It's defining the concept of theological fatalism. It says, fatalism is a thesis that human acts occur by necessity. Um, the word necessity, a matter of fact, if you read early church fathers, they use, instead of using the word determination or determined or predestined, they use the word of necessity. Necessity is another word for determined. It's, it's done by necessity. It's done by determination of someone else. And so I'm not doing what I'm doing by my own free action, but by necessity. In other words, I could not do otherwise. Um, and, and this becomes kind of the, the change out word within the philosophical um, worldview and even in early church writings of the concept of determination. Now, those who held to um, define determinism or this concept of the necessity of all actions um, were known in the first century as in first, second centuries as being the Gnostics of that day. Um, and that's that's just a fact of the matter. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be accusatory. It's just the, the earliest writings of of. Uh, the church are fighting against Gnosticism, the Manichaeans and the other Gnostics, who held to um, a form of determinism by which they would hold to the the fact that all things were brought to pass by necessity, that all things were um, were, occur by necessity. Um, And the early church fathers, those who were discipled by our own apostles, men like Polycarp, Irenaeus, Ignatius, Athanasius, um, later John Chrysostom and others, all vehemently, um, John, uh, uh, martyr, um, uh, that was, n- we know the name martyr from Justin Martyr. Um, he, he also fought against Gnostics and has writings against this concept that all things occur by necessity um, and hence are ultimately unfree. They fought against it vehemently. That, I, I think that's just a fact of the matter. It's undeniable. We even have quotes from uh, Calvin and Beza, um, uh, uh, from Lorraine Bautner and other Calvinistic scholars, um, Sam Storms and others, who admit that the early church fathers did seem to stand against um, any kind of a theological individual predestinarian view like is seen within Calvinism. And they did hel- hel- seem to hold to what is typically understood philo- philosophically today as libertarian free will, the, the, the ability of the will to, to refrain or not refrain from any given moral action. In other words, to do other than what one chooses to do, um, <clears throat> which is a distinction from doing other than what God eternally knows one will do. The, sometimes those two items are conflated under this theological fatalistic idea if that if God um, infallibly foreknows that something will happen, then it happens by necessity, which as we've learned before is a modal fallacy. Something can be certain, but not necessary. Something could be known, but not determined. Um, to, to assume that because something is eternally known, um, that it must therefore have been uh, necessitated or determined by that person who knew it is simply a, 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 a non sequitur. It does not follow that someone knowing something uh, before it happens is somehow the determiner of that thing that happens. And that's the, the fault line, I think, within Calvinism and any, any others who hold to any kind of a theistic, fatalistic worldview. And so with this definition in mind, fatalism is the thesis that human acts occur by determination, by necessity, and hence are unfree. Theological fatalism is the thesis that infallible foreknowledge of a human act makes the act necessary, i.e. determined, 
and hence unfree. You know, catch that. Now, open theists as well as Calvinists both believe that this statement is ultimately a truth, and they want to avoid, both both Calvinist and open theists want to avoid theological fatalism because they don't believe it's true, that ultimately the thesis that infallible foreknowledge of a human act makes the act necessary and hence unfree. And what the, what the open theist says, well, well then ver- therefore God doesn't infallibly foreknow um, all things, all human choices and actions. And the Calvinist says, well, yes, God foreknows all human actions and, and choices because ultimately he has determined those things. But yet men are acting according to their free will, their desire, which is actually a desire that's predetermined by God. Um, and therefore they are acting uh, in compatibilistic freedom, meaning they're doing what they want, but what they want is ultimately determined by God meticulously. And that's their form of what they call compatibilism, trying to try to make free will, i.e. doing what you want to do, compatible with, um, with divine determinism, uh, the necessity of all things being brought to pass by God. And the way they do that is by redefining freedom, not to mean actually doing what one chooses freely, that they, that where they could do one or the other freely, but that one is doing what they have been predetermined or pre-programmed, in a sense, to do by their nature, which is determined by God within the given circumstances, which are likewise determined by God, which is just a form of determinism, as we've discussed here dozens of times. Just just clarifying, um, they're ultimately saying, if, if there's been a being who knows the entire future infallibly, then, then no human act is free. And, and open theists believe that's true. That's why they say that God does not um, have eternal foreknowledge of all things that men freely do. They 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 could uh, maybe God maybe the open theist would say they could he could know those things, or the open theist might say that he knows all possible choices, but he just doesn't know the actual choice that they would make um, until they actually make it. Um, and then of course the Calvinist says, well, yes, God knows the the future infallibly, but the reason he knows the future infallibly is because he is determined the future infallibly. He has necessitated it. It's by necessity that we choose to sin, therefore. Um, And therefore, you've got either theological fatalism on the one hand um, or um, a a more open theism on the other. But can you find a middle ground that's actually more palatable and better that is is not theological fatalism, is not denying uh, the omniscience of God? Is there a a good middle ground? And is is it right to call a Calvinist theological fatalist? Are they falling into fatalism, whether they want to or not. Obviously, they're not meaning to. Obviously, they strive to avoid the, the accusation of theological fatalism. But can they, based upon even the definition of the terms, is that if, if it's something that occurs by necessity, it's unfree. Well, the only way you can make something, call, call something free that's unfree is by redefining freedom, which is exactly what the Calvinist does, to redefine freedom to say you're doing what you desire to do, even though your desires are ultimately determined by your maker um, and within the given circumstances that are also determined by your maker. That's the way they get around this, wh- whether they're actually getting around it or not, is debatable. But that's the way they strive to get around this theological fatalism. And the question ultimately is, have they succeeded in doing that? And that's what we're going to look at today. Before we jump into this and you hear from John Piper and a quote from him who's asked the question, how do you avoid theological fatalism? I want to tell you about a few things that I want you to be aware of. Here's my website, uh, my blog, Sociology 101. I uh, post uh, new blog articles um, every once in a while when I have the opportunity to stop and write. And uh, you're able to go there and you can use the search feature. I encourage you to do that. I get a dozen emails or more a day asking different questions about articles um, or have you addressed this passage or that passage? Please go here first and type in that search feature right there. Um, and you can just go in there and you can type in, let's say, fatalism even. Um, and say, hey, has, has Leighton written anything on fatalism? And you can type in fatalism right there. And guess what? Several articles come up where I actually address the issue of fatalism. Um, and so you can, you can do that for yourself instead of writing and asking me for those things because I feel horrible not answering all your questions and, and helping direct you, but I just don't have the time to, to search those things out for you uh, with all those emails. And so if you can help me with that, that would be great. A few other things we want you to know about. Notice also, if you want to support this ministry, help to spread the news, um, help to make uh, the podcast the top on the list when people search for soteriology or theology or Calvinism issues or predestination issues or traditionalism or any of those kinds of searches, um, 
help us to pay for getting us at the top of the search engine. Help us to pay for the broadcasting fees of what we're doing here on the podcast. Help us to be a part of the, the search when people are searching for these answers instead of only finding things from, from Calvinists, well-known Calvinists, from Desiring God or Lingonair Ministries or Grace to You Ministries or the Gospel Coalition or Together for the Gospel or all the different Presbyterian sites um, and, and uh, Calvinist Corner and Monergism.com and you, the list goes on and on and on, all of which have a huge amount of budget resources, you can help make um, traditionalism and what we hold to a, a higher search feature when people are looking for answers to these questions, they're finding um, other uh, options besides the Calvinistic answers to the hard questions. And you can become a monthly donor, which we love having patrons. I think we have 64 patrons now, and I'm excited about that. Uh, they without, the, without them, we would not be doing this. It would not be possible. Or you can make a one-time donation, as you can see there. There's a little video there. You can learn more about how to support um, Soteriology 101 and uh, to be a monthly supporter. We always welcome people to come and be a part of that. There's also a beliefs page right here. This is a great place to go if you have questions about traditionalism and what we believe and why we believe it. Um, there's an updated resource list of, of, of commentaries and Bible studies that you can use. Um, and, and if you have suggestions for those that we can add to that list, just send them my way and maybe we can add them to the website. <clears throat> also, um, I work with, um, as an adjunct professor, Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary. So if you're ready to get your theological degree or audit some courses online, go to uh, trinitysim.edu, or you can click on the classroom link here at Sociology 101 and find more information about how to get a theological education online at your convenience and for a much cheaper price than uh, many of the traditional seminaries um, may have. Now, I recommend a lot of great seminaries, especially some great seminaries here in the state of Texas um, and, and New Orleans, where I graduated from for, with my uh, my doctorate degree, um, and uh, Southwestern, and, and, and uh, I know Truett Seminary is here in st Texas, uh, Hardin-Simmons, where I graduated for my undergraduate work, has a, a seminary as well. There's some great seminaries around. And, and I recommend them. I think they're great schools. But I think you could also um, consider uh, Trinity because Trinity is so much more flexible and um, cost effective if you're looking for an education as a full time, especially as a full time pastor or minister that needs to, to find time for an education and needs help financially. Um, Trinity is a great option for you to consider. So uh, I, I, these guys are great guys. Um, Braxton Hunter, Jonathan Pritchett, and the professors, the hundreds of other professors that uh, participate in Trinity are guys that you should most definitely consider. Now, with any further ado, let's go to this quote um, or this link from um, John Piper, where we have uh, kind of a question answer time. I'm not even sure where he's located when he's doing this question answer. This is just a a uh, something that came up on YouTube that I, I, I stumbled across. And I, I want you to hear the question and then uh, to clearly hear John Piper's answer. And then I, I want us to go back and kind of unpack w what he said. And I'm not going to play the whole thing. I, you can go to uh, YouTube and search this and find it for yourself and watch the whole thing if you want to. Um, I encourage you to do that, in fact. Um, it, it's only fair to to fully hear somebody in the context of what they say. But I, I really want to, to hone in on a, a couple of comments that he makes and just see if they stand the, the, the test, so to speak, of, of what would be considered logically consistent and, and what's, what's right as far as what we're looking for for, for biblical um, truth and an understanding of, of God and his truth. So let's listen in. Dr. Piper, as a Reformed theologian, when you emphasize the sovereignty of God, how do you keep out of the trap of fatalism, especially in your preaching, your practice, and your prayer? How do I, as a Reformed theologian, avoid fatalism? When I, let's see if we can put a definition on fatalism. Fatalism, I take, would mean um, que sera, sera. If God wills everything, then what will be will be, and... Uh, do what you want to do, or no point in praying, no point in evangelizing. You can't have any influence on the future or whatever. Is that roughly what fatalism would mean to you, or do you want to define it more closely? Um, not so much as the looseness of it, but the logic when we emphasize the sovereignty of God is easy when you're following the five points of Calvin to to go into that, that, well, What's going to be is going to be. We have the language of it when we discuss the predestination, when we discussed earlier. You quoted the scripture. They weren't of us, so they, they went out from us. 
So it would have never made any difference how much preaching they heard, how much witnessing. That doesn't resolve. That doesn't absolve us from our responsibility. But needless to say, we we come into this idea of what's going to be is what's going to be. How do you stay out of okay. that? Okay. The the way I stay out of that is by being more biblical than reformed. That is, I don't draw inferences from from theological logical suppositions or assumptions. I go to my Bible. All right. Now, I, I know what he's intending to say there when he comes with the answer that I, I, I'm trying to be more biblical than reformed. Now, I don't know many reformed people who would like that, that, that um, soundbite um, because obviously any doctrinal system uh, systematic is striving to be biblical, and therefore they would hold to a biblical systematic. And so I, I think the sentiment that he's trying to get to is that instead of being um, what seemingly would be consistent with his systematic, he has to be consistent with what the Scripture says. That's ultimately what he's saying. I mean, he, he's saying, yeah, I know it seems inconsistent with the claims of the Reformed theology, it seems inconsistent to, to not just go say, hey, what will be will be. And so, therefore, I want us to be consistent with what the Bible says, because the Bible says we need to be involved in evangelism. The Bible says we need to be involved in prayer. The Bible says we need to, we need to act as if we do affect the future. We need to pray as if we do affect the future. Therefore, I want to be more consistent with what the Bible says than what my Reformed theology logically seems to entail. This sounds a lot to me like what we read from um, Charles Spurgeon when facing passages like Second Timothy, Second uh, uh, Peter three nine, or First Timothy two four, where it clearly expresses God's desire for all people. Let me read that uh, quote for you, and you'll see what I mean. Uh, Charles Spurgeon writes this. He says, "You must, most of you, be acquainted with the general method in which our older Calvinistic friends deal with the text, First Timothy two four. All men, they say, that is, some men, as if the Holy Ghost could not have said some men if he had meant some men. All men, say they, that is, some of all sorts of men, as if the Lord could not have said all sorts of men if he had meant that. The Holy Ghost, by the apostle, has written." all men, and unquestionably he means all men. I know how to get rid of the force of the alls according to that critical method which some time ago was very current, but I do not see how it can be applied here with due regard to truth. My love of consistency with my own doctrinal views is not great enough to allow me knowingly to alter a single text of scripture. I have great respect for orthodoxy. But my reverence for inspiration is far greater. I would sooner a hundred times over appear to be inconsistent with myself than be inconsistent with the Word of God. Now, just pause right there, okay? That's, I think, the sentiment that we're hearing from John Piper and his answer is to how do you avoid the case of Ross or Ross, what will be will be natural conclusions of a theological fatalist or a theological determinist or a even a compatibilist who's striving to maintain that God has ultimately brought to pass all things that the reason he foreknows all things is because he has determined, he has planned, he has decreed, he has ordained, he has brought to pass all things for his glory. Um, how do you not fall into thinking the logical outcome of that is the theological fatalism um, of, of what's naturally consistent with that? And, and what you hear Piper saying is, okay, I want to be consistent with the Word of God even over myself. Over my, over my own theological worldviews as, Calvin, as, as a Calvinist, and as Spurgeon is somewhat Calvinistic-ish as well, he's saying, I'd rather be inconsistent with my theology, my systematic, than be inconsistent with the Word of God. That's what he's saying. So in some ways you can respect the fact that he's, he's willing to hold up the Word of God even if it appears to be inconsistent with other claims that he holds within his systematic. Um, listen to what he goes on to say. He says, I never thought it to be any great crime to seem inconsistent with myself. For who am I that I should be everlasting consistent? But I do think it a great crime. 
to be so inconsistent with the word of God that I should want to lob away a bough or even a twig from so much as a single tree of the forest of Scripture. God forbid that I should cut or shape, even in the least degree, any divine expression. That's from Charles Spurgeon, Salvation by Knowing Truth, and uh, the links there provided on the site. So when, when we hear that kind of phraseology, what we're, what we're needing to understand from Spurgeon, Piper, other notable Calvinists, is that when they're confronted with the consistent, the logical consistencies of their claims, they seem to appeal to a, a form of uh, go to the Bible instead of to my system because I know my system seems inconsistent with what the Bible says on that point, but somehow, mysteriously, it's really not. That, that seems to be kind of how they have to answer these kinds of questions. Um, and that's why I think you hear John Piper giving this kind of answer. And he notice he, he defines fatalism as kind of this case sera, sera, what will be, will be. What he's talking about there is not a difference between what theological theists actually believe, a theological fatalist actually believe. Um, he's a, a different from what a compatibilist or a Calvinist would hold to, because what a theological fatalist believes is the exact same thing as a Calvinist. The difference is not their beliefs. The difference is not the claims of their two systems. Both of them believe that all things happen according to necessity and that God foreknows and has determined all things. God foreknows it because he has determined it, and therefore the claims of theological fatalism within Calvinism are true. The difference between a theological fatalist and a Calvinist is not the claims of the two systems. The difference is the application of the two systems. In other words, how do you apply what you believe in day-to-day -day life? A theological fatalist applies what they believe, i.e. that all things are necessary and determined by God. Therefore, I can be passive. I don't need to pray. I don't need to evangelize. I don't need to be active. The Calvinist, on the other hand, says, no, 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 no. We don't apply logically our system in such a way that we become inactive in prayer and evangelism, but we still believe the same thing the theological fatalist does. We just apply what we believe inconsistently with what we've just said. In other words, we apply what we believe because the Bible says for us to apply what we believe, though what we believe is consistent with the theological fatalist. Do you see the difference between the two? But what's so ironic and what's the Achilles heel of this whole thing is who is the one determining how a Calvinist or how a theological fatalist responds to the claim of theological fatalism and determinism. Do you see what I'm saying? In other words, how a person replies or responds to a belief system is ultimately determined by God himself. So God is the one who has meticulously and sovereignly determined if someone who holds to the necessity or the determination of all events by becoming inactive and not involving themselves in prayer and not involving themselves in evangelism, in other words, becoming hyper in their views, God is the one who determined that they would become hyper in their views based upon the very claims of both of the systems. And if someone becomes active in evangelism as a Calvinist, as one who holds to determinism of all things, who determined for him to become active? God did. And so God is the one who's ultimately determining, i.e. decreeing, bringing to pass by necessity, whether the person who holds to the, the joint view of theological fatalism, of all things being by necessity and determined by God and thus unfree, God is the one who ultimately determines whether that person will apply it logically consistently and thus become hyper and inactive, or if they will apply it logically inconsistently and become active and involved as if they really do have freedom of the will. In other words, the best answer a Calvinist can give to this quandary is, yes, we believe theological fatalism, but you're not supposed to live as if you're a theological fatalist. You need to believe and live. I mean, you need to you believe like a theological fatalist, but you need to live as if you believe in libertarian freedom. Okay, well then, why, <laughs> just, skip a, just skip over the belief and just say, why don't you believe what you practice? instead of trying to inconsistently hold to a theological fatalistic worldview while not acting logically consistent within that worldview.
that that's the question that you ultimate. If you're going to appeal to mystery anyway, which you are, I mean, you are appealing to mystery at some point anyway, why not appeal to our mystery instead of yours? And you won't have that logical inconsistency, inconsistency to deal with. Um, and I, I wrote on this um, not long ago. Let me pull this up because this goes through really, the, the, there's a lot of Calvinists who write on um, sovereignty and evangelism. You'll see many Calvinists put out um, articles on this. Uh, many of them talk about this because it's really the first question that people ask when faced with the Calvinistic worldview. They're asked, well, why do we involve in evangelism then? Well, that's a natural response to think if, 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 if all things will be, if, if everything's determined, then why do I need to be involved in evangelism? Why do I need to pray? Why do I need to do anything? Because everything is determined beforehand anyway. So why do I need to get involved? And so Calvinists have spent quite a bit of ink over the years answering that question and kind of coming up with ways in which they can answer these 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 views within their worldview. So let's let's look at one article I wrote addressing that. The title of this is is called the Is Calvinism Theological Fatalism, which you can find there at Sociology 101. And uh, so let's just go through this. Um, it, it says this, it says, when I was a five point Calvinist, I was also evangelistic. I participated in mission efforts. I was active in sharing my faith with others just as much so as I am today. And so in this blog on, and on my podcast, I have regularly strived to help my non-Calvinistic brothers understand that Calvinists are not typically anti-evangelistic um, and that every modern day Calvinistic pastor or scholar that I know of um, and that I respect they um, are very interested in spreading the gospel to all people. John Piper, for example, is one of the most mission-minded pastors. Uh, I think of John MacArthur. I think of um, uh, even even the guys over at Lincoln Amer Industries, R.C. Sproul, and um, I, I think of Matt Chandler here in the Dallas area. All of these guys are very missions-minded, very evangelistic, very church trying to church church plant, start new missions projects. All of I know this. <laughs> I know this to be a fact because I get messages on a weekly basis from people in all parts of the world who have stumbled upon my podcast who have said, well, we have a lot of new churches in the area who are Calvinistic. Um, churches are, are being spread all over the place, and many of them are coming from those of the Calvinistic bent. Um, and so to say that Calvinists are not evangelistic or not missions-minded or not trying to spread um, the gospel and spread even their views of the gospel um, is just short-sightedness. Um, it's not true. It doesn't bear itself out. Now, have there been throughout history some people who have been hyper and become anti-evangelistic? Yes, of course, there have been. We know of that throughout history. But that doesn't mean that people today who hold to these theological worldviews are. And so as logically inconsistent as it may appear to some, it is a verifiable, verifiable fact of the matter that most modern-day Calvinists today, especially within Southern Baptist Convention, are very much missions-minded. Think of David Platt, the, the head of the missions department for the, the, Southern, the Southern Baptist. I mean, he, he's very missions-minded, and you can't, you, can't, um, you, you can't really uh, dispute that fact of the matter. Um, this fact, however, does not negate the merit of some sound logical arguments raised against the Calvinistic belief system that we've already been talking about here. There is good reason— that when believers are introduced to Calvinism, their first question typically is about the necessity of evangelism, the necessity of prayer. This natural reaction to the teachings of Calvinism is evidenced by the volumes of work which have been produced by Calvinistic scholars over the years to answer this objection. What is that objection? If I were to restate it and reword it, here's the objection. When somebody first hears about Calvinism, I heard this all the time. In my 10 years of being a Calvinist, when I would first bring up the concept of Calvinism and when they kind of got what we were talking about, that God has ultimately chosen who will and will not be saved, that he's ultimately desi designed the world to be where he decides um, ultimately whether we will choose to respond in faith to the gospel. Um, once they understand that, that it's determined by God, the first natural response typically is something like, well, if God has unchangeably, sovereignly, if you will, determined who will and ultimately will not be saved, then what does it matter if I evangelize or not? That's the objection. That's the big question that's often raised. Well, below, I've got an article by a respectable Calvinist who's attempting to answer this all-too-common question, and he gives a very um, typical answer 
that most Calvinists would normally give in this kind of um, situation, and he does it in a real concise way, is the reason I chose this particular article. He says this, he says, some will see the Calvinist as holding to what is sometimes called theistic fatalism. Obviously, much different than pure fate-type fatalism, this view would acknowledge God as the cause of all things, which certainly true, but then would lead to false conclusions of inactivity. And this really is ultimately what separates a theological Calvinist from a theistic fatalist. The conclusion we draw based upon God's sovereignty and ordination, fatalism leads to inactivity, while Calvinism leads to the opposite. The Calvinist belief in God's sovereign power does not lead to inactivity, but rather activity on a grand scale. And part of the reason for this is that a Calvinist believes that God not only ordains the end, but also the means. Fatalism, however, largely is unconcerned with the means, holding to more of a let's eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die sort of philosophy. This is much different from the result of a Calvinistic philosophy of God's ordaining work. The Calvinist teaches that while God ordains the end of salvation for his elect, he also ordains the means of their salvation through belief in the gospel. Pure biblical Calvinism would lead to vibrant forms of evangelism, as I think you clearly see displayed in the New Testament by the apostles. So the end and the means are both ordained by God. And that's from uh, Shane Kassler, and the link is provided there on the website. With that said, I go on to write this. It's interesting to me that when a Calvinist seeks to defend against the charge of being a theistic fatalist, he often argues, well, God not only ordains the end, he also ordains the means, as if that point is something that the theistic fatalist would in any way deny. You see what I'm saying? In other words, does a theistic fatalist try to say, well, no, God doesn't ordain the ends or the means? Um, no, of course, a, the a theistic fatalist believes that everything is done by necessity, as we've already defined. But so does the Calvinist. Everything is done because it's been determined by God. Everything has come to pass by his sovereign decree. Everything is, is for the ends of the means, everything in between. It's all of God. Both views are holding to the exact same claims, like we talked about before. Both views have the exact same claim. The claim is exactly the same. Don't pretend like theistic fatalism is a different claim from Calvinism. It's not. It's the same claim. The difference is in how you apply it. Okay, that's the only difference. And who determines how you apply it? Well, if the claim is true, God determines how you apply it. So God determines who will and will not be a theistic fatalist and a hyper-Calvinist and therefore become inactive in prayer and evangelism. God determines for them to become that way. Based upon a view, by the way, that they both claim to be true. So keep that in mind. That argument does not avoid the charge of theistic fatalism, but in fact, it affirms it. For what is, a theist, what is theistic fatalism if not God's determination of not only the ends, but also every single desire, thought, and action, the means that bring about those ends? What does the Calvinist think this qualification is accomplishing in their effort to distinguish themselves from the theistic fatalist? The belief that God unchangeably causes every meticulous detail the, the means, of both the ends and their given means, is at the very heart of what theistic fatalism is all about. Are there theistic fatalists out there saying, well, God doesn't determine the means, while the Calvinists are going around correcting them, saying, no, no, God does actually control the means too? Of course not. Both systems of thought are clearly affirming that God is the cause, the determiner, the one who necessitates every single thing meticulously, including the ends and their respective means. So what is the author seeking to accomplish by pointing out the common belief that Calvinists share with the theistic fatalist? My conclusion is this. It appears to me the only real difference between a theistic fatalist and a compatibilistic Calvinist is that the latter refuses to accept the practical implications of their own claims in order to remain consistent with the clear teaching of the Bible, which is exactly what you heard from John Piper earlier. I, instead of trying to be reformed, Try to be biblical, is what he ultimately said. In other words, I've got to be consistent with what the Bible says, i.e., go and evangelize, even though the logic of my system says it doesn't matter whether I evangelize or not. 
in both theistic fatalism and in Calvinism, if God sovereignly decrees for me to go witness to my neighbor, he will give me the effectual desire to go witness to my neighbor. Is that wrong, Calvinists? Tell me if that's wrong. In both systems, whether you're a theolog- theistic fatalist or you're a Calvinist, God has sovereignly determined if you will desire to go and witness to your neighbor or not, right? And if my neighbor is one of the elect and God has unchangeably elected for me to be the means by which my neighbor comes to Christ, then logically, I would have to believe that God will give me the effectual desire and opportunity to carry out his preordained plan, God's ordained means. If that effectual desire never comes, if I never have the desire, in other words, to go and preach and speak to my neighbor, then why couldn't I rightly conclude that it ultimately was not God's preordained plan for me to be the means through which my neighbor would come to Christ? The only logical argument a compatibilistic Calvinist could bring to this charge is, well, that's true, but you can't think of it that way, which is what Piper was ultimately saying. Yeah, it's true that the claims of the fatalist is right, but you can't think of it like a fatalist. You can't apply it practically like a fatalist. You can't be consistent like a fatalist would be. You have to be consistent with the Word of God, which is mean you've got to go preach whether or not it's consistent with your system or not. You've got, to go, you've got to go witness whether it's consistent with what the claims of your system are or not. His actual beliefs are untenable and must be ignored in order to remain consistent with the biblical mandate. If you go back and reread the Calvinistic's explanation posted above, you will notice that there is no difference in the actual claims of the Calvinist and the theistic fatalist. The only difference is in how the person chooses to act, applies his belief. They both believe the same thing. The difference is in how you apply it. The theistic fatalist applies his view consistently. The Reformed Calvinistic compatibilist applies his view inconsistently, even by Piper's own explanation. He's consistent with the Bible, not with Refor- Reformation theology. Can't be consistent with Reformation theology and, and still be consistent with the Bible. That's ultimately what you have to conclude. So in response to that commonly held belief of divine determinism, and therein lies the problem for the Calvinist, for that choice is just as unchangeably determined by God as is the choice of the elect to believe. Did you catch that? Please hear this. God is the one who not only decides who will believe or who will not believe as far as salvation is concerned, he's also the one who decides who will be active and who will be inactive when it comes to evangelism. He also is the one who decides who will pray and who won't pray as a fatalistic believer, as one who believes in divine determinism, sovereignty as defined by the Calvinists. He's the one who decides how they will apply that view according to the claims of both theistic fatalists and Calvinists. Did did you follow that? Under the Calvinistic system, God unchangeably determines those who will accept the belief that God only, not only ordains the ends, but also the means. And he determines if that believer will respond with evangelistic activity or inactivity. In other words, God's responsible as to whether or not you as a Christian are active or inactive in your evangelism efforts. In other words, God decides if the believer, the theistic determinism, will become a hyper-Calvinist who refuses to actively participate in evangelism or a productive, obedient Calvinist like the author referred to above. You see, Calvinists are known to argue God has ordained for his elect to be saved through the proclamation of the gospel. Right? Calvinists, am I, am I misrepresenting you yet? I'm quoting from Calvinists. I'm trying to represent you correctly. I really am. And I'm asking you the question, Do you affirm with me that God has ordained for the elect to be saved through the proclamation of the gospel? I would think that you do. Matter of fact, that's a quote from a Calvinistic source. But wouldn't you also, as Calvinists, likewise argue that God has ordained for the saved to proclaim the gospel when they do proclaim it and not to proclaim it when they remain disobediently inactive? After all, the author does affirm that God causes all things that come to pass— which would include the inactivity of the saints, would it not? In other words, God sovereignly ordained for hyper-Calvinists to exist. God sovereignly ordained for people to fall into theistic fatalism. How? By fatalistic means. How do you get around that? Think about this. If any particular Calvinist chooses to disobey God and not proclaim the gospel when impressed to do so by the Holy Spirit, who is really responsible for that choice to disobey? 
Has God, for some unknown reason, not granted the sufficient grace to convince the will of his messenger to proclaim the truth when told to do so? Or has that messenger disobeyed of his own libertarian free will? And what is the result of that disobedience? When an individual Calvinistic believer disobeys God's command to evangelize, did any fewer elect individuals respond in faith to, than what God ordained? Well, of course not, not within the Calvinistic worldview. Why? Because God ordained for that Calvinist disobedience with the same level of sovereign control as he does in ordaining for another Calvinist to obey and to preach when he calls him to preach. You see, a Calvinist may argue that evangelism in general is necessary for the salvation of the elect in general, but logically, your individual responsibility to evangelize any particular elect person is not necessary for the salvation of that elect person. After all, if you were ordained to evangelize that elect person, then you would have. <laughs> you would have sovereignly wanted to do so by his decree. If you weren't ordained to evangelize that elect person, individual, then someone else was. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been elect. Now, granted, Someone, not necessarily you, has to share the gospel with the elect in order for them to be saved within the Calvinistic worldview. But if God has ordained you to be that evangelist, then he will give you the effectual desire to do so. Thus, if you refrain from doing so, you could rightly conclude that you weren't meant to be the means for that person's salvation, thus putting the responsibility of your inactivity on God rather than taking that responsibility for yourself. You are left with a perfect excuse for your inactivity and disobedience to God's command to evangelize the world. Quote, God unchangeably ordained the means, or in this case, my lack of participation in those means. How does any theological fatalist or compatibilistic Calvinist get around the claim and the truth of this statement? God unchangeably ordained the means and my lack of participation in those means. If he actually ordains the means, then he's ordained that you are involved in those means or that you're not involved in those means. So the next time a Calvinist argues that, quote, God ordains the ends as well as the means, just remember, this doesn't avoid the charge of theistic fatalism. It actually confirms it. In fact, their system logically affirms that the believer's inactive disobedience is as much according to God's ordained plan as is another believer's active obedience, and both of them are for God's glory. In other words, God ordained hyper-Calvinism for his glory, and God ordained non-hyper-Calvinism for his glory. So both hyper-Calvinism and normal Calvinism are ordained, brought to pass by necessity for God's glory. So how do you call one of them good and one of them evil? Why have you deemed that you, Calvinist, are better than your theistic fatalist friends who are applying their same claim that you believe, that God has by necessity brought all things to pass, they're applying their, their views consistently by God's ordination and divine sovereignty, and you are applying it differently by God's plan and sovereignty, by God's decision, and both are bringing his glory to pass. So how are you to deem your view as better than theirs? How do you call them wrong and you right? On what basis are you right and they're wrong? If and when a Calvinist becomes hyper or anti-evangelistic in his behavior, he does so by God's decree, according to the claims of Calvinism and theistic fatalism by that, by that same definition. And so too, if a Calvinist becomes highly evangelistic, like John Piper or um, or David Platt, if he, if he becomes a, a big missions leader and pastor and, and s planting churches like Matt Chandler is all over the nation, if he, if he does that in his behavior, he's, he's doing it because God has sovereignly decreed for him to do those things. He, he's, God is the one who's sovereignly causing Matt Chandler not to be hyper. Um, and he's doing these things because God has ordained for him to not apply the logic of his system into a fatalistic worldview. And so, too, if a Calvinist becomes highly evangelistic in his behavior, he does so equally by God's decree. God ordains the means. And so a consistent Calvinistic scholar cannot get around the logical fact, no matter how much theological rhetoric they use to place, placate their opponents. The best they can do is say, just don't think of it that way. This is what Piper is ultimately saying there. Just don't think of it that way. You, you can't apply it like that. 
which in essence means act like what we believe is not true. And to that, I would say amen. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks for attending our online university classroom. Remember, this is a listener-supported ministry, so please consider becoming a patron of the podcast by donating online. Join our team and help spread the word. For more resources, books, and articles from Professor Flowers, or to learn how you can support this ministry, please visit www.soteriology101.com.